everyone. Hi. Hi, it's Eve and Amanda here from the PB team. So we're here to give our weekly live to just uh, have a bit of an update about what's been going on in the industry this week, what's been in the news, what we've been doing. And um, so we're just going to kick off with a story that's had quite a bit of interaction on our site and on our social channels, which is the fact that um, there's been a call for um, injectables to be banned for under 18s. And most of you have commented that you're quite in agreement with this idea. And um, it's actually um, a report by the Royal Society for Public Health, which is a charity, um, just expressing the fact that kind of in the light of the popularity of things like lip fillers on Love Island, which mm. most of us are watching at the moment, probably yeah. not Amanda, but the rest of us. <laughs> um, I tried. <laughs> She's giving up. Yeah. It's great. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess that there's a lot in reality TV and a lot of other um, kind of social media. There's lots of images of very young women particularly um, with lip fillers and mm. it's really boosted an increase in demand so there's been a bit of a call to to kind of just put an end to it at, at too young an age so under 18s. Yeah. yeah there was a good quote actually from their spokesperson that said um, there's a huge pressure on young people to conform to the unrealistic and unattainable ideals that they see on Instagram and shows like Love Island but there are no age restrictions on non-surgical procedures which means any 15 year old could just walk into a shop and get their lips injected. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's part of a much wider issue on yes. any kind of regulation on the, on injectables. But I think just them being so accessible, particularly on the high street to, to young girls, is certainly a concern for a lot of people. So it's just quite an interesting debate. Have a have a look on the website and check out some of the comments, uh, and also on our, our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and another big story this week has been about John Lewis encouraging their customers to recycle their beauty empties with a new in-store scheme. So they're like the latest kind of beauty company that's trying to take part in this kind of war on single-use plastics and um, they are doing this beauty cycle trial for a month in 36 of their stores, basically saying to customers, bring in your empty beauty packaging, we'll recycle it for you and for bringing it in we'll reward you with £5 to spend on your next beauty purchase. Um, they've teamed up with TerraCycle for this, who are going to pick up the packaging, separate it properly and get it recycled. And so I think it's just, it's just another positive move because, you know, the beauty industry does generate a lot. Yeah, a lot of plastic waste. And the problem is a lot of people don't really know what to recycle, what can be recycled. So John Lewis are kind of being the middleman and saying, bring it in we'll sort it out for you. It's that there's actually an incentive because I think with a lot of these um, kind of initiatives it's a tax on the public isn't it or it's a tax on people that don't yes. stick to the rules whereas an incentive to to make a bit of a change is a nice way to to do it and hopefully get people to think a bit more about it. Yeah and this is like hot off the back of um, the government saying they're going to ban plastic straws and cotton buds as well and obviously there's always talk about wet wipes as well and the BBC's programme about plastics that's been going on, they were showing the amount of wet wipes that get flushed and cause fat bergs mm. and just the problem because they're plastic, they don't degrade. Um, people still don't realise that, which yeah. is, is crazy. So it's an education issue as well. But yeah, so it's, don't know. it's a good move in the right direction. It'd be interesting to know if you guys give any advice to your customers about how they can mm. recycle their products or when they're buying stuff, you do tell them that this part of it can, this part of it can't. Like, how much do you know from the brands that you stock about whether all yeah. of it can be recycled? Yeah, do they pass that information on to you yeah. to, to give to clients? And also probably you're telling them not to use the face wipes, which is a key thing. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I mean some things you can't recycle the, the cap or the top, but some of them you can, and it really depends on the council that you're in in the borough. So it's really confusing, but this is like a really good step, and it'll be interesting to see if other big retailers follow suit. Yeah, um, so oh yeah we've got a really good blog on our website from con uh, consultant Valerie Del Forge talking about well washing in the spa industry and she's asking the question is everything being given a wellness spin to make it trendy and marketable it'd be really interesting to know your yeah. opinion on this and whether you think she's right she's wrong um, is there too much so obviously because wellness is such a big buzzword at the moment mm. there's so many people trying to cash in on that that don't necessarily have a, a genuine kind of wellness angle to their products or their services. And I think we saw the same a few years ago with the word spa in general. So mm -hmm. it's because there's no set definition of this is what spa is or this is what wellness is that everybody agrees on. It's easy for people to kind of cash in on it and try and take advantage and jump on the bandwagon a bit. So it's yeah, how do we, is there anything we can do about that to kind of promote the genuine benefits of wellness or mm. what's real and what's not? And um, is it an issue? It'd be interesting to hear what, what you all think. Yeah, I mean, I've even seen it on drinks and clothing. Yeah, which 
it's not too much. Open, you know, things that are very much like household <laughs> products. You kind of like, mm. <laughs> take a moment for yourself and just have a nice drink. Oh, yeah, is that one mm. <laughs> Maybe. To a degree. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is, um, there's a feature on the website as well about ways to make your salon or spa more dementia friendly. This is a really interesting one, Amanda wrote it, but <laughs> it's, it's a really good read. There's a lot of information in there that I think a lot of salon owners wouldn't necessarily have thought about mm -hmm. in terms of how to, how to achieve that. I think even just general knowledge, I learned a lot um, through doing it because there's just simple tweaks or changes you need to make in your protocols or your customer service that can really make a difference for people who are living with the disease. And um, with one in three, no, I think it's a person in the UK will develop Alzheimer's every three minutes, according to the Alzheimer's Society. So, you know, with people living longer, the numbers of people who are actually are living with dementia is getting higher. So the likelihood that somebody in the early stages could come into your salon and spa is just getting more likely. Mm -hmm. So it's about equipping yourself and your staff so that you know how to deal with it and provide them with a nice, enjoyable experience. Yeah, and there's so many ways in which spas and salons can help people that are going through mm. this condition because it's a really nice, relaxing, soothing kind of place to be, as we all know. So mm. it's just about how you can provide that service without it being intimidating, which I think in some senses mm. it's just the language to use and the kind of setup to, to follow. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, and there's been research to show that aromatherapy can really help people with the disease as well, especially for memory and for um, helping calm them down. So anxiety, which is a common side effect of having it. Um, so it's even just, you know, you've got the tools there already. It's just about executing it right. Yeah. So I think making sure that we're just being as inclusive as possible as an industry. We've had a lot of discussion around making sure people going through cancer treatment are made welcome in spas. So it's, it's another client group that might feel marginalised that there are ways that they don't they don't need to be. So mm. it's a really interesting one. So yeah, check it out. Yeah. But I think that's everything. it in terms of our content. We mm. just wanted to also remind you of our events that we've got coming up. We've got Aesthetic Medicine North this weekend Yay. in Manchester. Oh, next weekend. Sorry, next weekend. <laughs> don't go to Manchester <laughs> next weekend. Not Saturday. <laughs> next weekend, so a week and a, little, a, week and a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you've got aesthetic therapists in your team or if you are a clinic, um, it's definitely one for them. It's advanced treatments. So that's, that's one not to miss. Um, and we've also got a networking, a Salon Inspire networking event coming up in um, July, 1st of July in Birmingham. Um, so that'd be a good one. It's it's a really, really good way to kind of interact with other salon owners and share your challenges and business solutions um, and we'll all be there and it'll be a really good day. So have a look on our website um, for details of that one. Yeah. That's it. That's it for now. So we'll, we'll see, see you guys next week. week. Bye. Bye.